scary part. I'm not sure exactly what they meant. But if you read Madison and all these people, they were dead set against foreign wars. They were dead set against a whole lot of things. They did not want to get involved in Europe. They did not want to have European wars. You could read Madison, you could read Hamilton, you could read Washington. They would Washington want to go foreign entanglements. I mean, it's not like an isolationist. It's so, it's, war is such a ingrained thing. It's so many people, it's such a problem. It's, it's crazy. When you were saying about truth and everything else, uh, and photographs and everything, they've been suppressing truth about uh, uh, wars. I don't know, maybe it's a I don't know. I know in uh, World War II, you've been taking photographs of the other dead people, and you're talking about massive bombing in Iran and Iraq. Right? Those places, of course, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, we were convinced that these things were good. Right? And we were told, and we were raised by all these movies, and we were told and told, and you're going to have to do something. Uh, this has gone beyond stupidity. It's, it's getting into, do you have a question? Oh. <laughs> uh, yeah. You want to stop wars? Do I want to stop no. wars? OK. Do I have a serious question? Uh, you said something about Russia and uh, about the wars in the past. Something about Russia, something about the, the truth of the wars. And you mentioned Russia specifically. I'd like to know about that. Was it about Syria? Well, I, I, I can't necessarily make an accurate guess what that was, but the only time I remember mentioning Russia was about today, not any particular war or anything in the past. But I think it's important for us to know today that the United States is antagonizing Russia in an unprecedented way, resulting in Russia threatening numerous European nations with war if they keep cooperating with US and NATO aggression, with the expansion of NATO to Russia's border, with the, with the you know, not just, Star Wars is not back just as a movie, which, you know, Ronald Reagan often couldn't keep straight which wars had been in movies and which ones had actually happened. But, you know, Star Wars was the thing he wouldn't let go when Gorbachev was willing to get rid of it, all the nukes. You know, now it's back in the theaters and in Romania and in Poland. Uh, and you've got U.S. tanks and U.S. troops and NATO forces in Georgia and Poland and all these exercises on Russia's border that it views as threats and treaty violations. You've got an effort to get NATO membership or partnership with Ukraine and Georgia. You've got US ships in the Black Sea and the Baltic. Uh, you've got more nukes being moved into Europe. Uh, you know, this is all seen by Russia as threatening, as dangerous. And the other thing that happened with the Iran nuclear agreement in 2000, uh, in, you know, last year, 2015, was, we said, look, if without thinking that they were actually going to follow this logic, but by their logic, if all the missile defense weapons, so-called, in Eastern Europe were really about Iran, and Iran was now not a threat to send any missile anywhere, they could pull all that stuff out of Eastern Europe. Well, they obviously had to either admit it's all about attacking Russia, or come up with some new bizarre excuse or just go on saying it's about Iran and hope nobody would notice. And they went with that last one. Uh, you know. So you, you now have all of this uh, militarization of Russia's border to defend the United States from Iran. And Russia doesn't believe it for a minute. It is, it is treating it all as acts of war. Uh, and you know, building up its nuclear program now just as the United States has been doing. Uh, and talking up militarism, just as the United States has been doing. And Russia has shown enormous restraint. But I don't think you can count on it forever. Wow. So this question has to do with the idea of chaos. Okay. And um, if you look at the wars that, that we get involved in, it seems like everything gets worse after the war. Um, you know, I, I used to think that the idea was that you go out and you try to win a war, and we never win, everything gets worse, and, but, well, first of all, I guess I want to ask you, you know, do you see things this way, and also, I, I don't think I've ever read anything in the alternative press that says that the U.S. foreign policy is just to create chaos because 
it's just really good for business. Yeah, but well, Cindy may want to speak to some of these too, but I, I would say, you know, that you can't win a war. There's no such thing as winning a war. Jeanette Rankin said you can't win a war anymore, you can win a hurricane. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's not something you can win, it's not something that's fought in a battlefield between two forces. You know, it, it, these wars are not distinguishable from genocides. These are mass murders of people where they live, you know, and uh, over 95% of the victims in recent wars are on one side, civilian, more elderly and young than in between. This is what these wars are, uh, and I don't know what winning them would look like, but it wouldn't justify them or excuse them. My favorite uh, Ben Franklin quote is, there was never a good war or a bad peace. Uh, and, and I think, you know, we have to, we have to remember that. Uh, a, a lot of the wars do create chaos, you know, and clearly, the Pentagon and the weapons makers and many of the politicians and people in power in Washington would rather destroy a country and create massive violence and suffering. Uh, you know, although they would prefer to take it over and be welcomed with chocolate and roses and have everyone bow down before them, they would much prefer total chaos and hell and violence to, you know, peace. You know, that's way on the list. I mean, that's like when in the DNC's preferences, you know, here's Hillary, here's Trump, here's Bernie. You know, for the Pentagon, it's, you know, have the Iraqis love us, destroy another country and create chaos in the region and more terrorist groups to fight, and, you know, down here somewhere is peace. Um, they, they, you know, they don't mind creating chaos. Uh, certainly the weapons companies don't mind. Most of these wars have U.S. weapons on both sides. Syria has U.S. trained and armed troops on both sides, on multiple sides, you know, fighting each other. Uh, it's good for business. Um, I do have something to say on, on this question. Um, so, Iraq, before the um, first George Bush invaded it, and ever since then, of course, the U.S. has been um, actively at war with Iraq, sanctions. Bill Clinton, when he was president, you know, <clears throat> the sanctions were uh, rigidly enforced. Uh, two to three million Iraqis died because of the hardships of the sanctions. And Madeleine Al Albright <clears throat> said that those deaths were worth it because was it like a million and a half children, Iraqi children died? But before that, Iraq was considered a secular state. Women had rights, women were doctors, physicists, um, you know, any professional uh, attainment, highly educated, but also a country that was diverse in its religion, Christians, Jews, in the Muslim faith, Sunni and Shia, and um, there, was, there was no uh, sectarian so-called violence in Iraq. And my, I, I know people there now, and from there and there, and they say, you know, so if there were, my dad's a Shia and my mom's a Sunni, so am I supposed to be at war with myself? Bam, bam, bam. You know, so, um, of course, war is for division and chaos and cause that uh, so-called sectarian uh, uh, violence. Uh, but I was at a town hall meeting before I went to Camp Casey. It was in January of 2005. It's when George Bush, we went to protest George Bush's second inaugural in Washington, D.C., and Nightline with Ted Koppel had a town hall meeting on whether we should have been in Iraq or what should we do now, and I wasn't supposed to speak, but he said, <laughs> I jumped up and spoke anyway, and he said, okay, can we have other speakers that aren't so emotional, and I was like, F you, my son's dead, you know, he just died like less than a year ago, am I not supposed to, am I supposed to be 
Huh. You know, I, I spoke the truth, but of course I was emotional. Anyway, a general was sitting next to me. And he, he was recognized and stood up. He was a retired general. King, I think his last name was. And he said, you know, we didn't, in, in, we didn't expect an insurgency in Iraq. That took us completely by surprise. And 